Hi, I'm Adam Jacoby, Curriculum Coordinator of the Harvard Debate Council Summer Workshops Program in Congress. And this seminar deals with parliamentary procedure and presiding in congressional debate. Underlying parliamentary procedure are several different theories, many articulated by General Henry Martin Robert when he wrote his Rules of Order. As Robert is quoted as saying on the bottom of my screen here, where there are no laws or individuals have their own rules and laws, there is the least of real democracy. The first concept is to embrace minority voice or opinion before majority rules. Next, to debate only one specific issue at a time. And that we have to balance individual rights along with the rights of the entire assembly. Time is of the essence during a congressional debate session. And the presiding officer or PO sets the pace and timing recognizing speakers and questioners in an effective and efficient manner. Members should respect the PO once they've been elected and the PO may not be impeached. In no other speech and debate competitive event can a student remove a fellow competitor. And that is the case in congressional debate as well. Once a student is rightfully elected to their position through the electoral process during a competition in a chamber, they are in that position until the tournament removes them for some reason of disqualification. So how does the PO candidacy and election process work? Well, it begins with a nomination. Typically, students get someone else to nominate them to serve in that role, perhaps a teammate or a friend. I have seen self-nominations on occasion, although that's rare. It looks better if it comes from someone else. Then the nominees are given the opportunity of delivering a brief candidacy speech of about 30 seconds or less. Then the adults in the room will typically conduct an election to determine who wins uh, the honor of serving as the student presiding officer for that session. And then once elected and installed in the front of the room, the elected presiding officer will explain their procedures. The chamber will typically adopt an agenda depending on the league or tournament you're at. This may happen before or after the presiding officer election, but will typically happen at the beginning of the first round of preliminary competition and then at the beginning of each elimination round that's held, whether it's quarterfinals, semifinals, or finals. Some areas have a caucus or committee before the session, so know what happens. It's more common around the country for the students to informally caucus and then for individual students to propose specific agenda orders for consideration by the chamber. When either meeting in caucus or committee, the debaters should consider the debatability as well as representation of authors so that every student who has a, an item of legislation they've written and would like to bring forward for the chamber's consideration has the ability to do so. This is a fair and just approach and any time that uh, you as a student are part of a, a group or a voting block, you should always consider how you are being inclusive for students who may not have the privilege of being part of your voting block so they do not feel excluded or discriminated against. Once an agenda is adopted by a majority vote of those students in the chamber, it becomes standing rules and can only be altered by a two-thirds vote to suspend the rules. There is no such legitimate motion as to amend the agenda. It literally requires a motion to suspend the rules. So let's talk about the process for motions in general. A motion is a proposal, let's say noun. The sponsor of the motion says motion to gain attention of the presiding officer, and then they move to or that something happened. 
Another member then seconds to give support for discussion. A second does not necessarily mean the seconder supports, although that's usually implied, but it means, you know what, let's at least have this discussion about whatever motion that um, the first person introduced. After the motion is seconded, the PO repeats it and calls on speakers, if it's a debatable motion. When no one seeks the floor, the chair or PO closes discussion or a member may move previous question, which means to end debate. Since closing debate hurts the rights of the minority to have a voice before majority rules, a two thirds or super majority vote is required first. Motions exist in a hierarchy, kind of like these Russian nesting dolls picture. The main motion is the proposed law or action that an assembly is taking. A subsidiary motion changes the course of action on the motion itself. An incidental motion changes how the assembly works, usually temporarily. And a privileged motion alters the physical constraints of the assembly, when it's meeting or where it's meeting. As the presiding officer or chair, the person in charge of facilitating the meeting is in charge of moderating and deciding on how motions are dealt with. That person, the presiding officer, should never call for motions. At the beginning of their term of office, they should remind members to seek in attention in between speeches to be able to move something. Do not say barring any motions either, because that's just the same as calling for motions, just in the reverse. And depending on the tournament formality, be wary or cautious of holding open chambers, where a, a rising to a point of personal privilege to exit the chamber is required. The reason this is important is when a student moves personal privilege, that signifies to several people in the room that they are leaving. This is also a safety and liability issue for tournaments to be aware of when a particular student is leaving, but it's also a competitive one. If a student is leaving the room, they are not actively part of the debate that may be happening while that debate continues on in their absence. That's important to note and good judges who are in the room moderating and evaluating the debate should keep track of that. In terms of opening a session, the presiding officer is chiefly in charge of calling the session to order. There is no such motion as a move to bring the session to order. There's no motion to open the floor for debate. The presiding officer takes care of doing all of those as a course of routine business. There may be a vote, in fact, there should be a vote to establish an agenda if necessary. The only time it's not necessary is if you're in a subsequent round of the preliminary sessions, or if you already have an established committee process by rules of your league or tournament that determine the agenda order based on committee decisions. Then the presiding officer simply begins debate on the first agenda item. There is no main motion the first item on the agenda, by virtue of being on the agenda, is the first main motion. And then every item on the agenda afterwards are the subsequent main motions. So I love playing this little excerpt here. So you will notice this excerpt from the movie Star Wars The Phantom Menace uh, involves the Intergalactic Senate. Uh, and I'm sorry to say that in congressional debate, we do not have 
hover podiums and lecterns from which to speak. Um, it's a little more informal than that. In fact, most congressional debate tournaments happen in high school classrooms. I'm sorry, so sorry to be the bearer of bad news. But seriously speaking, you see a great example here of a presiding officer speaking in the third person. The chair does not recognize someone in particular. So that's important to recognize as well in terms of that formality of the third person point of view speaking because what it does is it creates a detached objectivity for the presiding officer as being above and not involved in the debate. Presiding officers will typically stand up between speeches when you're in person. When you're on Zoom, um, they typically stay seated and just kind of continue the business normally. But in person, it allows the presiding officer to be both visible and heard because when you stand, you're able to project your voice better than when you're seated and you're, you're folding your diaphragm to some extent. Make sure you project your voice. When in doubt, doubt about actions and rulings, ask the adults who are in the room. The adult parliamentarian who's uh, tasked with assisting with procedural issues, or if there's no parliamentarian present, any of the judges in the room. And finally, pause, but never call for motions, which I've already said. Let's talk about the gavel. One of the favorite parts of congressional debate for a lot of students, because who doesn't love a piece of hardware that actually has a functional use? Please do not bang it excessively except to bring order to an unruly chamber. Uh, I have a, a coach colleague of mine who uh, once called a student Mr. Happy Hammer because he was just too zealous with the use of the gavel. Tap once to call the session to order. Uh, tap once to announce vote results. And tap once to single the end of questioning. There's also a, a time signal uh, usage of gavels where you'll typically tap once when one minute of speaking time remains, twice when 30 seconds remain, and three times when the student needs to wrap up their speaking, which is often customarily done as a norm 10 seconds prior to the three minute mark. The consistent banging can increase when the student is going over time uh, considerably, five to 10 seconds over time, where the student may start, the presiding officer may start gradually and getting louder um, to kind of override the student who's taking up everybody else's speaking time by extending beyond the grace period. In terms of floor debate, um, every debate on a bill or resolution begins with an authorship or sponsorship speech. There is no such thing as a first affirmative. Whatever that first speech is, is an authorship or sponsorship, period. Now, some individual leagues or tournaments may provide a special provision for changing the amount of questioning if a student does not stand for an authorship or sponsorship. But I will tell you, nothing makes my blood boil more at a tournament using NSDA rules when a, when a presiding officer says, is there an author present? Is there a sponsor present? Is there a first affirmative present? Ooh, present, rather. So whomever gives the first speech is an author if they're affiliated with the bill or a sponsor if they're not. And they always have the burden of answering two minutes of questions. Really, if you're in an in a area where um, you're not the author, you should be the sponsor then if you're called that. The first negative also has the burden of two minutes of questions. Every speech afterwards is a, is a standard three minute speech with one minute of questioning. For recognizing speakers, presiding officers should be simple and brief. Say, affirmative speakers, please rise. Or, negative speakers, please rise. Or you could say something a little fancier like, those in support of the bill, those opposed to the bill. But please, 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 please do not say, seeing as how that was just a speech and affirmation, we are now in line for speech and negation. Negative speakers, please rise. Ah! We are keeping track of the debate. We know whose turn it's time for. And all of that extra language just fills up time that could be used for speeches. I once timed 
the amount of time the presiding officer used extra unnecessary words, and it could have yielded two more speeches in that session. Two students were robbed of the opportunity to give a second speech because the presiding officer was too wordy. Let's talk about ethics. As a presiding officer, you need to recognize that bias exists. So first be mindful of your teammates from your school who are in the room. Then next, be mindful of those who are your friends. Also be aware of height, gender identity, race, ethnicity, religion, ability, sexual orientation, geographic location, school, all of those factors come into play. I'll never forget when I was judging a final round at a high stakes competition where a student called on all the students from the same state that that student was from and they were all male presenting students. So this student did not call on a young woman until after they had called on all the males first. That looked really bad on them as well as the familiarity of the students that they knew. What the student did not do is deliberately think about who the students were that they did not know and make a point to call on them first, to be more equitable, to acknowledge that they have bias and to deliberately make decisions to overcome that bias. Now, a more recent trend at tournaments is to create a preset recognition order for speakers so that the presiding officer's task is simply to manage that based on who stands to seek recognition at any given time. If a lot of this isn't making sense to you right now, that's okay. It will once you do your first uh, Congress session or practice session because you'll get a sense of how the student presiding officer calls on speakers for the opportunity to speak. By rule, precedence and recency are in place at every single con Congress tournament. This entails first recognizing those who have not spoken at all, followed by those who have spoken less. These first two steps are called precedence. The third layer is recognizing those who sp spoke earlier or at least recently, which is referred to as recency. It's important in order to understand where students fall on any of these three priority items by tracking the speaker order. You may choose to use a table, a seating chart, or uh, and even use recency for tracking questions, especially direct questioning. We'll talk about the different types of questioning in another seminar. So a recency table may have columns that, in, that indicate how many times the students have spoken, one, two, three, four, etc. cetera. Um, the presiding officer is customarily put at the top and a presiding officer is typically given credit for one speech for every hour they preside, which is just kind of a way of, of indicating how many points they get. So in this example, Washington presided. Okay. And then you just kind of indicate every time that someone presides uh, and then you can cross their name out in the first column. So Madison was the first speaker and then they're the third speaker um, in the second column, but they didn't stand up prior to that because Hamilton was the author of the second bill and then Madison wanted to speak affirmatively. That's why Madison appears later in this particular example. When you're in person, Having a visual representation of where all the students is, is helpful, and that's what a seating chart is for. In Zoom, that's not as important, in fact it isn't, although seeing where they are on the screen um, will influence when you may call on them, and being mindful of that uh, is helpful. In terms of voting, I always want you to think of a face, eyes and nose. Votes in favor are eyes, votes against our no's. You don't use yay or nay. Those are archaic reserved for roll call votes. And please never do a roll call vote in congressional debate. The voting record of individual congressional debaters is not important. Model Congress, yes. Congressional debate, no. So let's discuss voting methods. Viva Voce is voice vote. And that's the most common way of 
taking votes in Congress. It means a formal count is unnecessary. Often the Zoom equivalent is raising your hands so that um, it's effective. Uh, any kind of video conference software tries to moderate sound it's hearing and give the microphone and, and effectively mute, even if it's not physically muting, but muting the others so that the speaker it's giving attention to is, is pushed out audio wise to everyone else. So that's why a, a kind of a show of hands is better, better in a video conference type of situation. A standing counted vote or a show of hands indicates that the presiding officer will literally count each of those um, who are, are raising their hand in favor or against. This is the appropriate language to use um, in terms of rise or raise your hand. And then the pr appropriate way of announcing a vote tally is with 17 in favor, in favor, five opposed and three abstaining, the ayes have it and the motion carries, or reversing that with five in favor, 17 opposed and three abstaining, the noes have it and the motion is defeated. The amendment process is something that confuses a lot of congressional debaters, experienced and inexperienced. So we'll go through each step of the process here. Between speeches, the student amending will rise, ask for a point of personal privilege. PO will state that, ask for them to state that privilege and the student will respond to approach the PO and they will retrieve a form. This is what happens for in-person Congress. It's modified, of course, for online video conference conferences. The student will then write out the amendment, noting the affected wording and line numbers. And then between speeches, they will rise again, move a point of personal privilege to oppose, approach the PO, and then hand the amendment to the PO. The PO will review the amendment hand it to the parliamentarian who advises the PO as to the amendment's relevance. If they rule it germane, that means it does not change the essential intent and is legitimate for further consideration and debate. If they rule it dilatory, it means it effectively changes the action or purpose on a motion. In most cases, most amendments brought forward are germane and can add a lot of dynamism to debate and shouldn't be summarily dismissed. Anyone may rise to move the amendment once it has been received by the presiding officer. Then the presiding officer will read it, take a vote, usually a voice vote, for the one-third second. This is a motion unique to congressional debate in that if it's moved in a regular assembly or Congress, all it requires is one vote. The reason an amendment requires a one-thirds vote of those present is to make sure it's not wasting the time of people in the chamber. As I said, amendments can add a lot of interesting nuance to debate. You shouldn't be afraid of it just because it's something different. If the ayes have it and the uh, second carries, any member may speak. Recognition must be based on existing precedents and or recency if established, okay? Um, so that means that the student who authored the amendment doesn't automatically get to give a speech in, in support or sponsorship of that amendment. So a lot of times students have the misconception that the amendment process is a way to circumvent precedence and recency and get an extra speech in. That is not the case. Precedence and recency still reign when it comes to an amendment. There's no requirement, however, to recognize a speech. In some areas, a member may immediately stand and move the previous question. The chamber will then vote on the previous question to end debate on that amendment, even though debate hadn't started, and then they'll vote on the amendment. Uh, once the amendment has been voted on, if it passes, all debate after that amendment should be based on the bill as amendment amended. A lot of times students make the mistake of, of not making that distinction and they just continue to debate it based on its original form. So be careful about that. If the amendment is defeated, then there's no change and you return to the status quo from before the amendment. To lay on the table means to temporarily halt debate, but should, it should never be used with the intention of stopping debate indefinitely. It sh in other words, it should never be abusively used as a way to circumvent a motion to move the previous question. 
especially if you've just moved it and it's failed. This is just a language thing, but note the difference between withdrawing and rescinding. To withdraw means to pull back something that is pending and not having been voted on. To rescind is to reverse a previously approved action. A lot of times a student will say, I rescind my motion. They really mean is they withdraw their motion. And I know this is a, a subtle nuanced detail, but using the correct language across the board in congressional debate makes you memorable. It enhances your credibility as a contestant and will improve your standing in the eyes of judges. So in other words, if a member moves a motion that is seconded, both the mover and seconder must agree to withdrawing it from consideration if that happens. Orders of the day is often overused and for no good reason. It just means forcing compliance with the agenda at any given time and should simply usually be used as the previous question in congressional debate. There are some great resources including the definitive Roberts Rules of Order newly revised, currently in its 11th edition, that is authorized by the Roberts Rules Association, yes, that's legitimate, and co-edited by Henry Martin Robert III. Um, so it's, it's legit. And it has uh, a number of motions and uh, information for how to deal with those. But a really great reference source, perhaps one of my favorites, is O. Garfield Jones's parliamentary procedure at a glance. When you open this book to the center, you will see tabbed pages. And if you want to learn more about how the motion to suspend the rules works, you just put your finger on that page and it has all the information about suspending the rules. Do not use online versions of the 1919 or online public domain version because if you're trying to really learn parliamentary procedure for legitimate business assemblies, like I serve on a number of boards and commissions, knowing how this works is important. And there are provisions for electronic votes and meetings in Robert's Rules of Order newly revised in its current edition. The older editions that are now in the public domain lack that. So thank you for attending this session on parliamentary procedure and presiding. I will handle questions when we meet next again in our next session of the workshop. Take good care. Mm -hmm.